So next up, we move into lecture recital mode, and we have uh, two presenters in the next presentation, Julia Rossoniello and Josie Ryan, who are both PhD students here at Sydney Conservatorium of Music. Uh, Julia is a violinist and Josie is a soprano. Uh, Julia um, holds a postgraduate research scholarship in music history and creative practice and is also a recent recipient of the National Archives of Australia Postgraduate Scholarship. She's performed with many of Australia's leading historical performance ensembles and her current research into Australian historical performance practice has just come out, contrary to the bio, has been accepted, has just been published in Musicology Australia. I encourage you all to go and read that terrific article. And Josie uh, holds a master's degree in early vocal music and historical performance practice from the Royal Conservatory of The Hague and is currently undertaking PhD studies. Oh, sorry, I've already said that. She's a PhD student here. Um, her research focuses on the performance and reception of art music, popular music and traditional music by women of the Sydney Irish immigrant community between 1900 and 1925. And Josie's particularly drawn to recapturing social connections between performers encountered in her research. And I feel like we're getting a live demonstration of the social connections between performers right now. So thanks very much, Julia and Josie. Please welcome them up to talk to us. Okay, thank you, Amanda. Um, I think we would uh, also like to uh, begin the presentation uh, by acknowledging that um, we're here on Gadigal country and we would like to pay our respects to elders of the Aura Nation, past and present, and extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. Um, this presentation, it, it, um, it focuses on reimagining how violin recitals were presented in Sydney, 1900 to 1940. And this presentation is sort of a meeting place of Josie's research and my research. So um, my PhD research has really been about um, individual violinists and, and shining a light on what their individual practices were. And for me, that has, um, my key methodology really has been about collecting materials. And in some cases, this is historical editions it's um, performance parts that are annotated and marked up by the performers, um, some rare recordings, uh, concert paraphernalia, concert programs, letters, reviews, photos, like all of the materials I think um, that can say something about the way somebody uh, was playing at this time. So Julia and I have a lot of common ground in our research. Um, my work has actually, as Amanda said, led to a focus on social combinations of musicians coming from a variety of Sydney origins and backgrounds that one would not necessarily think were conducive to mixing, even to the extent that Catholic clergy reported as attending a concert in a well-known Anglican church at a time of documented sectarianism, for example. Um, so drawing conclusions from examining specific concerts I'm actually focused on mainly a collection containing source material about performance and reception of various styles. Um, a large amount of that is so-called violin recital performance as experienced by women of Irish extraction. And it is a, actually a collection compiled by my own great grandmother, which contains news clippings, concert programs, music examination reports with a focus on the musical development of my grandmother and her three sisters who all studied the violin and their friends and their associated musicians. So from this collection, I'm building a picture of performance and music education cultures in Sydney during the first quarter of the 20th century. Yes, yeah, so one of our interesting common, sort of common findings has been um, the picture of a performing culture that emerges when sort of all these materials and narratives are brought together. And so I guess the story we want to tell today is sort of the fashions of early 20th century uh, violin recitals. And this was, I guess, um, the things that s struck us as unusual to our, our modern experiences. And that is things like the violin recitals almost um, always uh, in these years included a vocalist in the programs. And uh, other things were just the way uh, fashionable, fashionable works were presented, variety programming. And we're also going to sort of touch on um, the nuances of performance as sort of discovered through performance annotations and editions and recordings. So the variety program also extended into vocal recitals as well, which begs the question, when is a vocal recital not a vocal reciting recital? Our expectation as 21st century um, 
and, and audience would be a recital as opposed to a variety concert would focus on perhaps just one performer concurring with some dictionary definitions such as a musical entertainment given usually by a single performer or by a performer and one or more accompanists. Um, so the vocal recital by Miss Rose McDonough that is up on the slide at the moment um, actually consists of more than two thirds of the program being a violin quartet, two other singers with a violin obligato in one song, despite the fact that the cover clearly calls it a vocal recital by Miss Rose McDonough. Um, so I guess like the talk today, um, it offers a perspective on how historical materials um, can provide an insight into practices um, that may have been forgotten and it invites us to consider how forgotten practices might inform current approaches to historical interpretation and exploring expressivity and programming more broadly. So um, in the early decades of the 20th century, um, Sydney saw a boom in classical music and this was widely reported on the newspapers at the time and it's sort of since been documented in the literature. And when I was sort of looking at this, um, I, I sort of did like a, a trove search of just the term violin recital. And um, I mean, this is not really hard science, but as you can see, just the, the number of hits for the term violin recital really shows a peak in the 1920s. It's probably likely there wasn't a huge amount of digitization of newspapers in sort of the late 19th century, but it sort of reflects what you what you read about in the newspapers and, and sort of the other um, the other sort of uh, reports about this boom in music in Sydney. Um, violin recitals were held in venues across the city, such as St James Hall, the King's Hall, Centenary Hall, the Sydney Town Hall, the YMCA Hall, Conservatorium Hall, and other small venues like the Apollo Club and the ALN Hall. Advertisements and reviews for these concerts reveal that many concerts advertised as violin recitals frequently included vocalists in the program. And I observed this when I was first documenting the concerts of early 20th century Australian violinist Cyril Monk, but I quickly discovered that this was a format that extended beyond Monk's practice and was a mainstay of violin recitals across the city from both local and international touring artists. So in terms of the international artists like Jan Kubelek um, included vocalist Erna Muller in his 1908 Sydney concert, Misha Elman included vocalist Eva Gautier in 1914 in Sydney. And this wasn't even sort of limited to Australia, like abroad, um, Kubelek very famously uh, toured with Nellie Melba um, between 1912 and 1914, and like Oban Musen and his wife were another sort of example of this touring duo. But really in Sydney, week in, week out, violin recitals across the city were including and being assisted by a vocalist. And this was a trend that continued into the 1930s and the 1940s. So with vocalists performing a number of items in the concert, it therefore also occurred that the violinist and vocal might play an item together as in that previous slide where we had um, an arrangement of the Bach Bruno Ave Maria um, with a violin obligato which we haven't actually been able to find the addition of. Um, so in other examples um, Nelly Melba and Jan Kubelik also recorded this Bach Bruno Ave Maria with keyboard, violin and um, and vocalist. Geraldine Farrar and Fritz Kreisler, 1915 recording of Pone de Lupe, and Francis Older and Misha Engelmann's Angel's Serenade, which we will perform for you later on today. There were also a lot of very important Australian compositions in this style, such as the highly anticipated Ave Maria by Mae Somerville, which was written especially for and sung by Madame Melba, and it had cello and violin obligato. And it also appeared in a concert in my own collection from Concordia Hall in 1914, sung, sung by the very well-known Sydney tenor Sid MacDonald with Bryce Carter and Henry Stale on violin and cello, and the composer herself on the piano. So that piece really fascinated us, and we do plan to present that on another collaborative occasion. Um, it was of considerable local importance being sung all over Sydney and taken to America, um, by John McCormack and Sousa even took a copy to arrange the band. So, led to all sorts of things. Um, sort of as well as spruiking the vocalist, um, concert notices advertised the well-known and attractive violin works. So for Sydney audiences in these years, one such work was Beethoven's Kreutzer Sonata. A 1925 report in the Daily Telegraph highlights Sydney's enduring affection for the work. Chrysler, the violinist who has captured musical Sydney has been overwhelmed with requests for particular numbers in his succeeding programs. There have been so many pleadings for Beethoven's Kreutzer Sonata, 
that the master has decided to play this great work tonight. Another regular favourite was Franck's Violin Sonata, um, which to name a few examples was performed here by Henri Van Bruggen, uh, Fritz Kreisler, Daisy Kennedy, Andrew Skolsky, Erika Marini, Ethel Holden, Yasha Heifetz, uh, Ernest Llewellyn, Phyllis McDonald, all in these years, it was uh, just incredibly widely performed. As well as these sort of very um, attractive works, an offering of shorter works and violin arrangements of well-known songs was another defining feature of the violin recitals of the era. Schubert's Ave Maria was performed frequently by local artists in Sydney, but also by famous violinists like Premislav, uh, Murray Hall, Misha Elman. Dvorak's Humoresque is another example of a very popular short work, which featured widely in Sydney programs, and that was also popul uh, potentially popularised by Premislav, Chrysler, Zimbalist, and uh, Hall again, who performed them in those years. So it was really um, not unusual for a recitalist to perform many, many short works in a single concert. And not only music, but also recitations. In more than one concert, there were recitations of poetry. And more often than not, as in this concert, the concert actually concluded with recitation rather than music, which would seem to us quite odd indeed. Um, so these programs were often extremely quirky. And I particularly loved the bit at the end of this concert, which was actually held um, in Epping, highlighting the times of the train so the audience were not <laughs> stranded in the sticks at the end of the night. Um, so um, it's particularly um, in the transcriptions of the songs and the more sentimental works in the programs that we can really observe some interesting nuances of performing style from the surviving performing parts in historical editions. And there's many more quirks and nuances than we have um, time to talk about today. So um, we're just going to mention a few really beautiful um, effects um, that are repeatedly indicated in the scores and editions of local artists, ones that really contrast with modern tastes and transport the listener to another era and possibly sort of intersect the traditions of vocalists at the time. So it's very clear from the editions that Portamento was a much more ut utilised expressive device in violin and vocal performance. And um, sort of to shine a light on what was practised in Sydney, on the Sydney stages, um, this I sort of analysed Cyril Monk's sort of 56 editions and um, annotated parts to sort of uh, get a picture of his performance style and the fingerings that indicate the various nuances of performance, his performance style. But beyond Cyril Monk, um, in my case, that's extending to other violinists of the time, Patrick Moore McMahon, uh, Gerald Wallen, um, scores of Alfred Hill, um, uh, the Essia uh, Voss Janssen. So the other people sort of working around the same time. And some of the fingerings, I guess, in the violin parts that really emerge that sort of suggest these different nuances of portamento. Um, the first being the sort of, um, most uh, straightforward kind that you might expect for violinists is where um, in, in one bow stroke, the violinist will move up the string in a single bow stroke using a different finger. And that's sort of um, creating a sort of a, a joining and a carrying of, of one note to the next. But in the violin parts, what's even sort of more exaggerated in many cases and is used frequently is when the violinist uses the same finger to move up or down the string in the same bow. And that's a very, pronounced um, sliding effect because all the intermediary pitches are um, being heard by necessity and it, it, it sort of points to a very, very um, expressive and exaggerated portamento type, which is really, really frequent in these scores. My favourite um, example of a sort of sliding expressive effect that you see in the Sydney, um, the Sydney editions is um, the one where um, the violinist will have uh, two notes of the same pitch and in the repetition of that note, the violinist will change from a higher finger to a lower finger to reiterate the note. And what that creates is sort of a lower pitch scoop to the repeated pitch. And it's a really beautiful and a sort of expressive effect and, and one that I've sort of observed um, in recordings in, in different editions. And um, it can be heard, uh, heard here. This is um, a really rare recording that I found in the New Zealand Library. This is of Patrick Moore McMahon in 1923. And, um, just coincidentally, um, this recording is a, a violin obligato part to an Ave Maria. So there's like a lot of things intersecting right here in this recording. And um, I've just got a little excerpt where you can hear him um, doing that repeated pitch with a different finger and you can hear the effect of that. <laughs> Um, 
Um, this is um, just a short excerpt from um, Alfred Hill's Dusk on the Hawkesbury River, and it's um, Cyril Monk, the Australian violinist's um, hand annotated part. And I thought this was just a really good one to show you because it actually includes all of the things I've just talked about. So you can see uh, with the finger numbers, I'll sort of give you an example. Um, like you can see with the one, the one one sort of shows where the violinist will go up on one string, but it'll be a second finger to a first finger. The two two shows where there'll be a slide on the same finger. And then in the next bar, the three to the two on the two repeated C shows that lower pitch scoop. So it should sound something like. This is sort of the effect of those fingerings, which is just incredibly beautiful. Um, Josie, so this is, I guess, and this is where we kind of meet in the middle because these beautiful, beautiful things um, is something, uh, you know, that I have had the feeling, you know, is very related to the, the practice as a vocalist and, and Josie's the best person to tell us about that. Well, it's actually fascinating for me to watch um, Julia do that. And when she showed me the uh, amount of effort that a violinist needs to go to to actually produce something that to a singer is a fairly natural thing that occurs, like obviously it's used consciously, but it was um, controversial and still remains a controversial thing among the vocal um, community, um, how to use effects like this. So it can be heard in the performances of vocalists from this era, definitely. And I've observed examples of that um, in recordings. We've both listened to Dame Nellie Melba, to um, all, all kinds of different people. Um, Do you want to listen to Ada? Yeah, let's listen to Ada Crossley. <laughs> because it deals with specific singers that yeah, unfortunately weren't recorded or um, their recordings, if they did exist, have not survived. Um, yeah, I haven't gone into so much detail with this, but just with my own singing, I have been trying to emulate it and you'll hear us do that a bit later. But you could certainly surmise that my singers sang in the experience of the singers that we've heard recordings of from this period. And that there's also cross-pollination of expressive gestures between vocalists and violinists, particularly as it's notated on scores that um, Julia has. And especially given the meticulous evidence you've seen that Julia has presented. Um, so naturally in singing, certain plosive consonants would lend themselves to that scoop effect, which is often called a portamento. It's kind of interchangeable. So in the song that you'll hear us demonstrate, um, you notice that there's also um, a particular need for expression on words that start with P or have a P in the middle or a B. So I notice I'm going to use it particularly um, in repeat. Um, so and then I use it the second time. So where you have a plosive consonant, you actually can naturally more easily without even necessarily being all that conscious of doing so. Um, so I found it really interesting how conscious a string player would need to be. Um, I've read a lot of Kun van Stada's research, obviously, um, about the misuse and overuse of portamento, and I found a very interesting anecdotal um, thing of Harry Gregory Hast in 1929 that he called it the cheapest and most easily performed stunt in the repertoire, and no good singer should indulge in it except as an embellishment. One portamento in a song, never more, and a particular singer answered, and that's once too often. But um, that singer was noted by Kun van Stada as applying no less than 30 portamenti and 19 scoops in 100 sung bars. So <laughs> I just found that really interesting. We're going to roll everything we've talked about into a reimagined performance. So we're going to form, uh, perform the Braga's Angel Serenade um, for voice and violin obbligato, which is very, very famous and very popular in Sydney in these years. Um, I'm going to be playing from a 1927 edition, keeping faithful to all the fingerings, um, which include all the things we talked about and some interesting open strings. And also you'll hear me like gliding up to the harmonics 
which is, um, you know, in the expressive lines is, is really um, characteristic of this time, but not so much what we do now. Um, and I'm also playing on gut strings to emphasize sort of the timbral differences. Um, and also because the sensation of playing on gut strings really sort of, um, you know, encourages these prescribed fingerings and we're just gonna sort of make it all happen uh, for you right now. So as we welcome Stacey Yang to join us, I'll just introduce the song. Um, it has two characters, a daughter and her mother, and they're having a conversation. And the violin is representative of the angel and the daughter may be considered to die at the end because the conversation deals with her hearing this beautiful violin as an angel beckoning her and the mother says no no it's just the wind it's nothing it's nothing um, this song was encored in a particular concert that i'm studying um, and yes this item was one of the most enjoyable in the night's entertainments of the freeman's journal
Thank you so much, Julia, Josie, and, and Stacey for joining in as well. So we have um, uh, a few minutes for questions um, and can take questions either from in the room or um, on Zoom. So please raise your hand on Zoom. I'd like to ask a question. Neil. I'll pass the first question. That was just so fabulous. Thank you so much and so convincing. Um, I'd love to hear a whole CD of that <laughs> sort of music done in this way. I'm wondering if I can just ask about, for you as performers, what, what's the transformative aspect of performing the works like this? I mean, all the information that you found, it's so convincing, but what's changed for you in doing this? For me personally, it's actually such a journey. Like last night when we were going through this piece, I realised we were 50 metres from where my grandmother used to live and she was at a concert where a friend of hers performed this or several friends of hers were the performers. So I remember Toby saying to me um, early on in my research, you should start your thesis with standing next to the grave of this performer. <laughs> I, you know, and it's just that kind of journey where you draw together, like, they're just names on a page and then suddenly you're inside someone's life um, and that has real influence on that that connective moment where we're actually doing um, a portamento in unison and you're like oh you know, it's, it's just a free song of something that you actually can't put into words it's powerful don't you think it's brilliant yeah i yeah. agree yeah. i think for me <clears throat> like neil you, you know my journey like I, I feel like you know this is um like many this is um you know, a project of many years, not not a short time. And in a way, now when I come to this music after sort of a lot of a lot of um, time invested in in the feeling of it, I think like every month that goes by, it feels easier to do. Like it's almost like I've got to live my life again as someone from the twenties, and I'm only five years old um, as a, someone from the nineteen twenties. But um, but you know, but the, but there's a joy in that. And I think for me, you know, more and more now when I pick up this music, like I feel. Um, like I feel like I, I can sing um, when I play and I feel like I can just be myself when I play and there's, there's a great freedom for me that comes with just exploring music rather than sort of even though there I'm sort of trying things that I might not otherwise do there's there's some joy and creativity and freedom that comes with that and that's why it's eternally satisfying for me. One follows so fresh and fantastic <laughs> it's new actually. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions in the room or on Zoom? Well, oh, yeah, Shame. Thanks for such a wonderful presentation. So I know that the Irish aspect didn't fit, you know, it wasn't a part specifically of this um, part of your joint project, but when you were looking at the violin recitals, was there ever any information that came out about people using, I guess, the ornamentation that um, reflected their own cultural heritage, because uh, I, I know uh, in my own research that that same thing of people criticising over ornamentation of pieces, but then that their own performance practice actually included a whole package of things that they considered were just part of performing. Um, you know, has that been an aspect of these violin and vocal recitals? Um, from the I'm just analysing the Irish content in the recital part of what I'm looking at and there hasn't been so much Irish content in the specific things that my grandmother, my great grandmother put into this scrapbook in the small scale. It's more the larger scale, the town hall concerts, the Thomas More nights and those sorts of things, um, which I haven't found um, the sort of level of um, yeah, the, the reviews of those concerts don't concentrate on aspects like that. What I was drawn to were how in, amazingly complex the arrangements of Irish tunes were that were performed at those and how it's almost that they've been sanitised and made into art music. And I felt that that goes with the effort of the um, immigrants to create, to recreate their lives as respectable citizens of, of the colony. I was, the juxtaposition of people um, standing at the town hall receiving an award from the governor when you know there's there's all kinds of things going on in Ireland in 1917 at the same time and you think what, what what was your actual you know feeling about the authority figure that you're talking to so I think the answer to your question is I, in my experience they're trying to 
raise this into a new level and become educated and, and not necessarily play the traditional music of their heritage in, in the sphere I'm looking at anyway. But I'd be interested to talk to you about your research. Yeah. And maybe one just last quick question because we're almost out of time. But yep, let's go again. Oh. Yeah, go ahead. Great. I'll be very quick. Thank you so much for that presentation. What a wonderful, wonderful exploration of, of this concert tradition. One of the things that strikes me about this kind of fusion of vocal recital and violin recital at the time is that the influence of one on the other would have been so much more strongly felt than perhaps when they're, you know, I go to my violin recital or I go to my vocal recital. And, and certainly it's obvious to me the extent to which singing techniques influenced violin practice. I'd be interested though to hear if and to what extent you think when you had vocal recitals but they were always playing with violinists, the opposite was true. Like to what extent do you think singing practices were influenced by the violin being there? Interesting question. <laughs> Because I always thought it was a one-way street, but that's a really, it's a really good way to think about it because we use that word cross-pollination, yeah. but, um, but as you say, like, it's sort of obvious the way that the, the vocalist translates across and, you know, and as we sort of identified, the text, I think, is a big sort of a factor in why it probably, you know, was sort of some of those effects accompanied mm -hmm. by the violin, but um, yeah, I don't know if you've got any thoughts about that. I think it possibly is more of a one-way street and, um, yeah, in that in everything I've read about how to sing, I'm always um, aware that um, it's. Have you ever seen something that says sing like a particular instrument? But on the other hand, I, I read things all the time that talk about play like a singer, um, and use your articulation, look at the words of the singer, that that kind of thing. So I guess. For us, um, we, we're listening and we're uh, using our natural musicality to, to sound like the instrument that is accompanying us. But um, certainly in the literature, I haven't come across the yeah, question. Yeah. But, but violins were very popular. Like, this, I mean, obviously singers were popular, but the, I think violin recitals had a very much a vogue. So I think, you know, in a way they support, they, re, they supported the recitals sort of just because they were so popular at the time and it was, you know, just another sort of attraction. Another, another singing voice. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> thank you. Terrific. Well, thank you. Thank you so much again um, for this wonderful presentation. I'm sure there's lots more conversation to carry on into the, the break after our next presentation. Not quite a break yet, but thank you. Thank you.